So what we're going to add to today, uh, well, there's there's something we've kind of glossed over a little bit. It's this idea that uh, when we stress an object, uh, the stress is the same throughout. It's as if everything we looked at had a rigid cap on it, and then we stress it, and anywhere in between that we might happen to look, that stress we've looked at as if it's uniformly distributed. In fact, what we're, what we're actually saying is that that force is the same throughout. So we just, cal we just calculated at any point an average stress as simply the force being exerted uh, distributed over the cross-sectional area. What really happens, or, or at least uh, a more accurate picture, is that there isn't this, this uh, virtual rigid cap so that when we do stress things with some low P, the object that will actually deform maybe, maybe something sort of like that as as it absorbs this force being pushed into it. The sides will curve in a little bit, the inside will deform a lot. Of course, this is greatly exaggerated. It's easiest to see this stuff if you don't imagine that our material here is steel, but if you imagine it's rubber, and if you pushed on rubber with two point forces, it would do something like that. If we had some kind of grid on here that we could watch deform, it would be greatly deformed as the material is absorbing this force. So now if we look at the stress distribution, we see that as we go into the material, say that uh, this is a width V, if we only go one quarter of the, that distance into the material, so if the material is, is 10 centimeters wide, we're now talking about only being two and a half centimeters in the, the, into the material. What we'd originally seen in our uh, sort of naivete through this class, this average stress, is really something much more like this. where before we had this average stress, but what we really see is some much, much higher peak stress because of this true point deformation of the material. If we go a little bit farther into the material, say one half B now, or remember B is the width of the material, so if that was 10 centimeters, we're now five centimeters into the material with the same point load, we now see our average stress that we've been using, uh, but just sort of uh, assuming that we've had overall, is now not quite as severe but still quite a bit more than the average stress. The peak stress the peak stress has decreased from what it was earlier, but it's still quite a bit over the average stress that we've been calculating as we go along, the simple P over A, because of this, this point loading. And it's not really until we're approximately a depth B into the material that's equivalent to the width B. We need to be about one, of, one width worth into the material before we really start to see 
that our average stress calculation is not so bad. There's just not that much difference now between the peak stress and the average stress. And we find that this occurs not only in uniform cross-sectional area pieces like I've got here where a point load, this also occurs any time there's a change in the cross-sectional area. Which are times like where we might have a hole in the material. For instance, there's a bolt fastened there, or it could be even something's attached there and needs to pull on that. We find that uh, we, we get this growing stress distribution that evens out, but then once we reach this cross-sectional area, all that stress is now funneled through a very small area, and we got we need to, uh, need some time for that to even out again. There's a lot of stress. Uh, if you want to look at it, you can uh, see that the, maybe there's lines of equal stress, and then they need to get funneled through these very narrow areas now, causing. Well, in fact, what we call it is. a stress concentration. Because there is this necking, this narrowing of the cross-sectional area to absorb the force, we have the stress being concentrated. Uh, it also happens when there's a change in area, as in uh, just simple a narrowing of the piece. And in fact, you've seen very often the direct attempts to address this. If these corners are sharp, then the stress concentration at those corners is very great. So what helps a lot is to ease the transition into this narrower area and you see this as fillets. This allows that stress concentration to occur much less abruptly. We don't have this piling up of these stress lines, if you will, at these corners. And in fact, if you want to test this yourself, it's very easy to do. Take a piece of paper, two pieces of paper, cut one like that, cut one like that, pull on the piece of paper, and it's going to tear very easily right there. You pull on it, this other piece, and it's not going to tear very easily at that corner because you've reduced the stress concentration at this corner and allowed the paper, more of the paper, to absorb the, the forces that are being put through it. So we, know, we need to know how to model these stress concentrations so that we can take them into account. The fact that the material is somewhat weakened by either these holes or these change in areas, these necking down areas, but not so much that we can't handle it. So we define the stress concentration factor as something like this. Given the letter capital K, that stands for concentration, I guess.
defined as the peak stress seen. Remember that was the, the, the high point of that distribution over the average stress that we've been calculating all along here. So very near the, the where the force was applied, and then maybe it was a little early to erase that. Very early, close into where this this either the force is now applied or where we have these changes in area, we had the peak concentration or the average that we've been calculating all along. But now we know that there's some peak concentration that we need to address. And we can do it with this stress concentration factor. Uh, perhaps it's easiest to show it in an example. We'll use this type of example of a filleted material. So it's going to depend upon a couple factors. If anybody needs help, Jake will draw a little picture for him. Are pretty good at the technical freehand sketching. We don't need to use vanishing points, Jake, because it's just it's a small piece we're looking at. Um, for this type of change in area, depends upon a couple couple uh, of the parameters here. The width of the full piece before it necks down. the width of the piece after the change in area, the radius of the fillet itself, and that can be either machined in like that, or it could be a weld. Either one will help to distribute that stress, relieve some of the stress concentration. And then the last of the factors on this is the thickness of the piece itself. Uh, that We need that for the cross-sectional area that's absorbing this piece. So we can take into account how severe the change in area is, how, how broad the transition to that change in area is with the fillet. The fillets can be very small, very tight fillets with only a little tiny bit of rounding, or they can be much more generous. The more generous rounding will absorb the stress changes better, but it uses more material if you're welding it's tough to build up a lot of material with a weld sometimes because you've got to bring in that extra material with the uh, with the welding done itself and it takes more time which means you've got the material heated for longer which can change its characteristics all kinds of things go on with welding uh, welding itself is a full other study What's nice is all of this stuff, uh, stuff has been done ahead of time, taking into account all these different changes in area, W down to H, what radius is put in there, what thickness is put in there. All of this has been done ahead of time. So all we have to do is read it off of the chart. This is a slightly different one than in your, is in your book. Your book is uh, five, figure 524. If you have your book, you can pop open to that. Uh, if uh, not, it's still pretty much the same thing. I just think this one's a little bit easier to read. Figure, sorry, 424. That's on page 161 of the new edition. I'm not sure where it is in the other, the older edition. Here, go ahead and take a look at it. Pal up here was 
Somebody you like. Go ahead. Come on. Frank, you got to meet somebody by the end of the class anyway. Might as well start now for spring break. Maybe there's somebody who's driving down to Daytona Beach. They'll take it. Look at that hat. Good man. Good man. Miss Congeniality, right there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Notice that the, the labeling is a little bit different than our book. I got this from a different book. I think it's just a little bit clearer to read because there aren't quite as many lines on the graph. But the graphs are still read in the same way, still basically the same thing. So we'll, we'll run through it real quick with a, with a quick example. Uh, we'll call this fillet 10 millimeters. The height W back here of the major piece, 60. It necks down to 40 millimeters, just to put some numbers on it, and has a thickness of 10. And we want to con do something like uh, find the maximum force that we can apply to this axially. Look at the loading we have here. This is an axial loading. We have been looking at torsion for the last couple days. We're going to come back to that in a second and do the very same type of thing. Uh, we need to find the maximum allowable force for an allowable stress of, let's say, 165 megapascals. All right. To do that, what we've done before is we took that allowable stress to be our average stress and just multiplied it times the area. What we have to do now, however, is take into account that that average stress is much smaller than is the peak stress. By this factor of k. So I've just taken our definition of k and uh, zipped it over there, replaced it with the, the, the average stress with that, times the cross sectional area. So that'll allow us to find the peak stress where this peak stress, now that's where we'll put in the material allowable stress. Before we put the average stress there, just assuming that the stress was the same everywhere. Also, we have two areas we're working with now. We have the cross-sectional area back here in the fat part and then a cross-sectional area back here in the narrow part. We use the narrow area as our calculation. That makes all of this a little bit more conservative. K is always greater than 1, as you can see on the chart, it doesn't even go below 1. Wouldn't make sense if the peak stress was less than the average stress. So uh, we reduce our power, uh, sorry, our, uh, our allowable force by the stress concentration factor. We're going to pull off the chart in a second. We also use the smallest of the areas. So that gives us the smallest P allowable for all of the available calculations. All right, so we just read it right off the chart, remembering that uh, the chart uses a W here and an H here. It's just a choice of the author, what designation they use, but the deal is the same. Across the x-axis, we do the fillet radius over the width of the narrow part. So uh, our chart says R over D. Your chart in the book will say R over H. Just an arbitrary choice in letters. So we have what? Uh, 10 millimeters for the radius of the fillet over 40 millimeters for the narrow width. So we're at 0.25 on the chart, which is right here at the, at the, uh, the little end point there. Almost, almost at the end of the x-axis. And then we go up to the line that gives us the same major width to the minor width, which 
this chart shows big D over little d. Your book will show W over H, right? For those different lines coming across. And for our case, that's what? Uh, 60 millimeters over 40 millimeters, which is two and a half. Sorry, one and a half. Yes, Bob, I'm getting old. Thank you. At least that wasn't tasered yesterday. So we go to the 0.25 ratio of the radius of the fillet to the minor width, up to the 1.5 line, which is that third line up from the bottom, and see where it crosses the chart. Looks like what? About 1.4. Oh, no, sorry. Wrong line. Fourth line up. One point, what? Just eyeball it. 1.63 or so. That look about right? Off that chart? 0.25 up to the 1.5 line. Where those two cross, we then go over and get our stress back. Actually, actually it looks a little more, more maybe 166. Remember we put a factor of safety in all of this anyway. So now we can finish and figure out what the, the allowable force will be to stay within the stress of the material, ultimate stress of the material, and using the stress concentration factor. So 165 times 10 to the, let's see, megapascals, 10 to the 6th newton meters per meter squared over the 1.66, and then times the cross-sectional area of the small section, which is 400 millimeters by 10 millimeters, so 40 Sorry, 400 times 10 to the, let's see, a millimeter is 10 to the minus 3, but it's squared, so it's 10 to the minus 6 millimeters squared. Before this, we would have simply calculated the average stress uh, over the area where we'd use our allowable limit, 165, times that area, or maybe even the bigger area since we hadn't done this type of thing before. But Typically, we look in the most endangered part of the material, which would be the narrower one. What's that come out to be? 165 by 400? Wake up, TJ. 40? It's less than this? Should be, should be greater than this because we divide by the 166 unless this number was wrong. I don't think so. Do be, tell me what here. Okay, so 66 kilonewtons. I guess T is getting old. That's what we would have done before, putting in much more force than we really should have once we allow for the fact that there's uh, stress concentrations 
specifically at these corners. So that, uh, that kind of calculation we can no longer do. It's just not conservative enough. We need to be conservative to make sure that these materials don't fail. And you can see the type of things you'd want to do to reduce the stress concentration factor. The smaller that is, the greater the load you can put in. You can do things like a bigger radius, a less severe necking down of the material, the kind of things you might think just through common sense anyway, if you had any. But you're here to accumulate that. That's what comes with getting old. All right. Uh, there's other possibilities in there. We also have uh, the same types of charts when there's a hole in the material. And as you can imagine, it has to do with the width across there, the width there, the, the diameter of the hole itself, and again, the thickness of the material. Those kind of charts are in there as well. There's also charts for tubular materials. Under axial stress. And there are also charts for this type of thing. Uh, I don't think our book has them, where there are bending moments on the piece itself. This is the type of thing, if you had uh, that as one of the simple types of beams we looked at, where there's some kind of intermediate load that would cause it to bend like that. That's what a bending moment does, and that's what we're going to look at starting, uh, starting Friday, I believe. We also have stress concentration factors for torsion loads, like the type we've been looking at for the last couple days. So we'll look at those now. Depends upon a couple things. As you can imagine, not too bad, aren't you? Depends upon a couple things. The major diameter back here, the minor diameter that we come down to, and the radius of the fillet. And then, of course, the load applied to the piece in torsion as it is. So we have the same types of concentration factors that we had with uh, the axial stress, only now we'll be looking at the shear stress. Remember, it was shear stress that was our concern in, in uh, torsion loading to the tune of TC over, uh, 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 drawing a blank, J. No, not getting old, getting older. Thank you. This is all we would have done before. We would have figured out the maximum stress at the outer radius, remember where we determined that it was, was greater, but because of this change in area, we have stress concentrations there, so we need to calculate a new peak stress where we take the original calculation we would have made which is to assume a, a 
uniform stress distribution and oh sorry not not normal stress shear stress and again this is always greater than one and so we can uh, now calculate an allowable stress limit so we'll we'll do a, a quick example with just this type of thing here so this is called a stepped shaft Operating at let's say 900 RPM. Uh, that's typically what uh, drive shafts do. They operate at some some uh, power level, transmitting power. We'll set an allowable stress, shear stress of 8 ksi. The fat end of the shaft is seven and a half inches in diameter. The narrow end of the shaft is 3.75, so we'll, we'll uh, take it as a, as a half increase in area. And we'll put a radius on the fillet of 9 sixteenths of an inch. Good old English units. We need to find the maximum power that shaft can transmit without violating the allowable stress of the shear stress of the material. First thing we probably need to do is remind ourselves the relationship between power and RPM and the torque that uh, can be transmitted. It's a combination of the speed with which it's running. 2 pi has to do with, uh, that actually comes from the conversion of radians because the units on this F for frequency is revolutions per second or what uh, what you people have taken physics to should know as a Hertz right that that you know look familiar to most people I hope you could well you know what a Hertz donut is don't you pow Hertz donut <laughs> What? No, I can edit it. <laughs> There's lots of stuff that needs editing out of the classes where you're here, Bob. Bob Phillips. <laughs> Student number 500. Something, something. I'll look it up. <laughs> Times the torque that's being applied. So we need to determine what's the maximum torque we can apply staying within this stress concentration factor and the allowable shear limits. Once we find what that is, then we can figure out what the maximum power is when this is running with that torque at 900 RPM. So, uh, most of it's plug and chug, however, we need to know where to get that K, and that comes from another picture in the, in the book. This one happens to be on page, uh, is figure 532 in the book, which is our section on torque. I think it's section 5.8, if I remember. Yeah, section 5.8, wherever that is. So if you have the, the page for the new and the old. Slightly different picture than is in the book, just because I think this one's a lot easier to read when it's put up. 
Um, the author of our book had, I think, more grid lines. They're a little bit darker and had more of these data lines on there. It just makes it harder to read. So uh, either one is the same. They're the same chart. This one's just, I think, lightened up a little bit. So again, across the bottom, we need the radius of the fillet over the minor area. Sorry, the minor diameter. Uh, yep, it is diameter. Always check that. So we have 9 16 of an inch. Watch your units because these ratios are unitless, which they wouldn't be if we had feet and inches mixed up. So uh, a lovely mix of uh, fractions and decimals as we do in the English system. So whatever 9 16 is divided by 3.75. What? 0 0.15. So we're going to be midway between, of course, point 0.1 and point 0.2. So we're going to be somewhere on this line, wherever one of those three lines crosses. And those three lines are big diameter over the little diameter, 7.5 over 375, which is 2. So we go 1.5 up to the 2 line, which is the top one, go over, looks like we're what, 1.33 or something. Just eyeball it a little bit. If anything, be conservative with it. All right, now you can finish the calculation. So you do that, take over a little bit. However, I do want the power in horsepower. Since we're dealing in English units, that's the typical unit of power. Uh, a sort of a subunit might be pound inches per second. So I'm old. I need to lay down for a nap. Been working hard already this morning. My, my power Geritol drink is wearing off. I'm coming to help. Um, we're going to take my time. I'm sprinting. Were you saying the smallest C and smaller J? Yes. Yeah. And uh, you can even reduce that if you want. One half pi c cubed. Because remember, J and C are are simply. Uh, geometries of the cross section. So if you put all those in there together, they do re reduce to that. And you do that for the small shaft. J over C is just a geometric factor. Some books even put it together into yet another factor, but this is more stuff to remember. All right, so we've got K off the chart. That'll allow you to find the torque load that can be applied, and then torque running at a certain speed is power. And again, this is the same chart as that in the book. More readable. One thing. All the yeah. Got it. Do you have your calculator today? Brandon doesn't. This is my job. Introduce yourself, Brandon. Ask to borrow his calculator. TJ, don't give it to him until you know at least his name. 
Not that guy. <laughs> Check if you got the same T here before you go into the power calculation. If you don't agree, no sense doing the power calculation. Always check these things as you go along if you can. Watch your units. small shaft. Do you guys agree? See, once you know the horsepower, then you can go down and talk to Earl at Ace Hardware and get, a, get our such and such horsepower motor. Oh, okay. 
not going to be edited. That, that stays as is. 890. Earl will stock uh, an 890 horsepower motor. He won't stock a 10,000 horsepower motor. Not that you need special order. Earl's the man at Ace Hardware, but other than that, I don't know. All right. Well, I think you purposely did it away the last few minutes here just so I couldn't give you a get out of class question. The only thing I would have done was. Uh, as you go through these type of calculations, if you were a designer here, you might then decide, well, we need to change the radius so you can redo the problem with a greater radius. Um, a final design radius I was going to give you is 15 sixteenths of an inch. That leads to a greater allowable power, about an 11 percent increase, 985 horsepower. So, if you want to check that, you can. That's what I would have given you now if you hadn't squandered away all the time doing simple algebra. What? We're still not okay. I'm still good. Colin. Get anything here on this? 